canyons where the ground isn't flat. Another key element in forest architecture are the grassy openings. Like the clumps of ponderosas, grassy openings have persisted for centuries, as indicated by phytoliths deep in the soil. Phytoliths is something Doc Smith taught us about. These are the microscopic silica structures that are in many plant cells, and they persist in the soil for a great long time. As the long fibrous roots of the grasses decompose, they create richer, more biologically active soil in these openings, and consequently greater biodiversity than under the trees. One local study showed that some grassy areas had eight times as much plant cover and three times the diversity of plants compared with the ground within the trip line and the trees. Sunny openings like this sustain warm season grasses that bloom in late summer, such as this blue gramma, and bloom on August 30th. These grasses tend to use less water and tolerate more heat than cool season grasses. Warm season grasses are attracting a lot of attention these days for their ability to, score, to store carbon, which keeps it out of the atmosphere. Grassy openings uh, sustain a rich diversity of insects and animals, from snakes to nesting birds. Juncos, for instance, make their nests under cover of bunch grasses and shrubs. <clears throat> There's a lot going on in the soil, very little of which we see because it's underground. For instance, Indian paintbrush like this has been found to be partially parasitic on the roots of other plants. I find the soil to be the greatest mystery of the forest, mainly because it's so, it's, you can't see it. Very seldom do we see what's under there. Science tells us that the major part of the world's biodiversity is in its soils. Much of it is in the form, however, of microorganisms and unfamiliar things like nematodes. Along with sustaining the growth of plants, soil is also important in carbon sequestration, that is, in keeping the carbon out of the atmosphere. Ponderosa pines tolerate soils broken down from a range of different rocks, including sandstone, limestone, and volcanic rock. But they do have their preferences. There are some places where the trees grow tall and robust, but there are natural bonsais with wizened trunks and short needles. Obviously, ponderosas wouldn't thrive, and they don't reach their full potential when they're growing straight out of the rock like that. But sometimes the reason why a tree isn't growing vigorously isn't this obvious. Other influences besides um, soil affect the growth and form of a tree, especially damage from snow, browsing animals, or mistletoe. But there's often a loveliness to these natural bonsais that enlivens the character of the forest, I think. Doc Smith told us that forest scientists use what they call a site index to let the trees speak for themselves. They measure certain trees at intervals of several years and track their rate of growth. The faster the tree is growing, the higher the site index. So even if it's not something measurable, the tree will tell you. Ponderosas can grow tall fairly quickly, but the way you can tell a really mature tree is that it has sturdy branches and a flattened top. And the wonderful, fragrant, rusty colored bark and large flat plates with dark grooves. The soil around where Tom and I walk is mostly derived from limestone, although there are some very sandy patches too. Limestone breaks down partly from mechanical forces, from vaulting, tumbling down the walls of a canyon, being wedged apart by plant roots, and weathering in the form of freezing and thawing that cracks it over time. We see this especially after a tough, tough winter. Limestone also breaks down chemically. It's composed mainly of calcite, which dissolves in acid. Lichens and mosses create a weak acid, and also act as a sponge that holds it next to the stone, steadily dissolving it. Rain picks up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to form a weak acid also, and seeping water can be even more acidic as it passes through decomposing plants. As the limestone dissolve, it, it dissolves, it releases particles, like sand, that form a matrix that then holds the organic material um, from decaying plants and animals. This seeping wall is a veritable soil factory in Bay Canyon. 
Not surprisingly, there's a lot of soil in the canyon that is rich from the decomposition of grasses and other plants, enhanced by the cool and moist conditions that persist down in Fay. There used to be a trail along the bottom of Fay Canyon, but the Forest Service redirected it onto the slope because it was causing erosion. But the erosion does show you how deep that soil is there. Although certain conditions can lead to deep soil as in Fay, most of the soils around here are pretty shallow. That's because rocks and organic debris break down slowly in such a dry climate. Even though they're evergreen, ponderosas can drop a third of their needles in the fall, and these don't break down very quickly. Sometimes there's a lot heaped up on the soil, and um, it doesn't add to the soil unless something else happens, like fire or, or breaking it away. <laughs> Some of the nutrients plants need, such as nitrogen, are bound up in the litter of pine needles and other debris, and they're not available to enrich the soil. This year, we've seen thousands of these tiny annual lupins, though. They're sprouting in a disturbed area where not much was growing. Bacteria and nodules on the roots of these little tiny plants will convert nitrogen into the atmosphere into a form usable by the plant. And these are annuals, they die at the end of the year, and when they decompose, the nitrogen will become available to other plants. So they enrich the soil. Whether deep or porous, another important aspect of good soil is that it is surprisingly porous. Whether deep or shallow, excuse me. <laughs> it has lots of space between the pebbles and particles. You can see, easily see this in spring after the frost, frost heaving of winter. The porosity of the soil is vital for the circulation of water, natural chemicals, and oxygen and carbon dioxide. It enables the soil to absorb and store rain, rather than having it run off quickly, carrying the soil with it. The zillions of soil microbes, fungi, and other plants and animals that live in it are much better off in porous than in compacted soil. Where the soil is undisturbed, it's a vast and mysterious ecosystem in its own right with all sorts of interacting microorganisms from algae to bacteria, many forms of fungus, insects, and both living and decaying plants and animals. It harbors a complexity that rivals what we can see above ground. All the activities in an ecosystem occur in soil just as they do where we can see them, from reproduction to feeding to predator-prey relationships. We generally can't see them happening, but a tiny hint of what goes on comes from mushrooms. These are among the mushrooms we see during the rainy August. Each is the fruit, or the sporocarp, of a web of fungus in the soil. Certain fungus have underground sporocarps called truffles or false truffles, which animals dig up and then scatter, and scatter their spores. Truffle roots convey moisture and minerals to the roots of the ponderosas while taking carbohydrates for themselves. Most, if not all, plants have this relationship with the roots of some sort of fungus, called a my mycorrhizal association. Most plants could not survive without this. There are lots of reasons why some plants require rich soil. After a while, you can predict where you'll find certain plants because of these requirements. We only find mountain death camas, this member of the lily family, in the rich, moist soil of Fay Canyon. It's a lovely plant, but totally poisonous. It's amazing how many plants contain chemical compounds, many of them with useful properties as medicines. Modern pharmacology grew out of the use of plant medicines. Every plant has one of these stories. Some plants actually shun rich soil and thrive on almost bare rock. This plant is called rock mat, and you can see why. It grows right on the bare limestone in full sun. Here it is, blooming happily. I've just learned from the ERI book that it's the host plant for the caterpillars of spring azure butterflies. <coughs> the same goes for Hidioma diffusa, or the flagstaff pennyroyal. This is a species of concern. We only find this little member of the mint family growing out of sun-soaked limestone boulders. The point is that unlike ponderosa pines, each of these plants is adapted to very narrow and sometimes rare growing conditions. The row wrote that heaven is under our feet as well as over our heads. Along with its soup of microorganisms, 
different kinds of fungus and a great multitude of different plants.